Welcome to the 2017 World Dairy Expo. Today's seminar is Consumer and Public Perceptions of the U.S. Dairy Industry, Implications for Practices, Policy, and Market Demand. The speaker today is Dr. Christopher Wolf, Professor, Michigan State University. Increasing public scrutiny of production practices in agriculture has significant implications for dairy producers. This creates a need to understand public attitudes and perceptions. Decisions farmers make about the production practices they have, the potential to the impact public trust, and their social right to farm. This presentation, led by Dr. Christopher Wolf, will assess these perceptions of the public and issues relating to dairy cattle welfare, allowing for discussion and monitoring. He will also discuss the economic impacts Public, per public opinions can have on dairy farm profitability. Wolf is a professor of agricultural, food, and resource economics at Michigan State University, where he has worked for the past two decades. His primary focus is the effect of public policy on farm behavior and financial outcomes, aiming to focus on issues of current and future importance to policymakers and industry decision makers. This, this seminar has, has been approved for continuing education credits from the American Registry of Professional Animal Scientists and the American Association Veterinarian State Board's RACE program. Forms are available in the back if you are interested in RACE credits. I would like to remind everyone to please take the survey at the end and to silence your cell phones at this time. Now let's introduce Dr. Wolf. Thank you. Thank you. We all good with the microphone? Okay, good. good. Thanks. Thanks. Good morning. <clears throat> yeah, so as, uh, as she said, uh, I've been working at Michigan State uh, for about uh, 20 years now. About maybe 12 years ago, we started looking more at animal welfare and some of those issues because it seemed to be an issue that was of increasing importance. Um, and I've worked with colleagues a lot of different places. I work a lot with Glenn Tonser, who's at Kansas State University, and Nicole Widmar, who's at Purdue. And so um, some of those things uh, that I'll talk about are studies that I've done with them or that they've done. And Jason Lusk, who's now at Purdue, does a lot, and Bailey Norwood at Oklahoma State. So um, it seemed like this would be a good time to kind of talk about where we're at and talk about the findings from the agricultural economics literature and what they mean um, as far as understanding the market implications and the farm implications uh, of some of these issues. So to be, uh, the word sustainable gets thrown around a lot. It's been thrown around a lot for the last couple decades. And whenever somebody says sustainable, one of the first things to do is figure out what they mean when they say sustainable because the, it, sometimes it is defined uh, inconsistently or um, differently than maybe you were thinking. So uh, to be sustainable agriculture today, and I'm thinking here about commercial agriculture, so people that are in it to make money, um, to make a living, which is where most of the food comes from, right? You have to be financially sustainable, so farms have to return enough income to pay for the labor management and capital that are invested in the farm. Uh, it has to be environmentally sustainable. And what that means has been changing over time, right? Um, this isn't like it was uh, a couple of generations ago when um, we didn't pay as much attention to you know, how wastewater was handled out of the milk house and things like that. Um, and a lot of things have happened in the last couple of decades as far as uh, nutrient management in, in um, as far as water goes, and, and all of the air stuff is <clears throat> probably coming at some point, but we haven't gotten there yet. But also, what's been increasingly important is the social aspects. Um, when you have a society as disconnected from production agriculture as we currently do, uh, where you only have 2% or so of the population that's actively involved in farming, then you have a large you know, the other 98% that maybe know somebody or maybe a previous generation or two generations ago the family was on the farm but they don't have a direct connection. Um, 
which, and I'll talk about this multiple times throughout, means you also don't have a context, right? I grew up on a farm, I have a different context than the people that I talked to that didn't grow up on a farm that only ever dealt with animals that were pets. And so the context matters. And then that has been a source of uh, increasing amount of uh, tension in, in some senses or um, something that farmers and farm organizations and agribusinesses and food retailers of any sort need to be aware of because they're dealing with it. And, and um, so consumers are increasingly interested in the methods employed in the food production. Okay, so not just what's in the food, what are the quality aspects, what are the contents, but how was it produced. And that's kind of really the focus of what I'm going to talk about today. And so that's animal welfare and that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about, but it's also things like technologies. And increasingly now with this discussion that has been going on with the GMOs, um, partly that's about the content of the food, but for a lot of people it's also um, how it was produced or how they perceive it was produced. Um, so production agriculture is facing increased pressure to, uh, to respond to these, whether you want to or not. Um, <clears throat> And this is a quote from a paper that's this year in the, um, one of the Ag Econ journals. I think just, I thought this is uh, summarized it pretty well, so I thought I'd put it up there. Number of consumers paying close attention to the health, safety, and social impacts of food consumption has increased rapidly and is no longer a niche phenomenon. The shift from traditional drivers of food choice, so traditionally as an economist we would think about price, we would think about income, we would take, think about taste and preferences and convenience costs and things like that, and that would be the primary decision making for the food consumption decisions. Um, towards more intangible aspects of food consumption has generated a strong demand for transparency in the food system. So you have, to some extent, demands for more understanding and more transparency. At the same time, you have a population that's increasingly disconnected and doesn't have the context to understand, uh, even if the question gets answered. And so we think about dairy. Um, fortunately, there hasn't been any of these recently. But over the years, periodically, right, there have been undercover videos released. And actually, these two pictures here um, are just ones that I did an internet search and grabbed. They were, you know, they just popped up. Um, so the undercover videos and the press that follows, and there's a literature that, that suggests that um, the market for the products, whether it be beef or milk or eggs, um, is hurt whenever these videos come out. So, you don't have to be doing anything wrong. You don't have to have any part of that, but the entire industry takes a hit whenever this press comes out that looks like this. So, farm production practices that have been mandated to change um, have happened in several different ways. And the, the two major avenues have been uh, either by laws and regulations, so, in Michigan, in 2009, there was uh, legislation passed and signed by the governor at that time that said in 10 years there would be no longer um, battery cages for laying hens uh, or gestation stalls for sows or uh, crates for veal calves. Um, and so that's not dairy, right? Um, at least not directly, but that, those are the type of legislation we're talking about. So, and they said that in, in 10 years that had to be implemented. The same thing happened in California with Prop 2 in 2008, which was almost identical, right? It had to do with the laying hen battery cages and gestation stalls, but that, was a, but that was the second one. That was a ballot initiative. So 22 states, the last time I checked, I don't think it's changed. 22 states have ballot initiatives. Michigan has ballot initiatives. California has ballot initiatives. <clears throat> And, and you, guess, guess what? what? You, you don't, don't have, have to have any idea, idea what, what you're talking about to vote on those ballot initiatives. In fact, my experience is, is um, well, actually, when, when I go, go vote, vote, I take I a cheat card with me so that, that I know I want to vote yes, yes on this and no on this. And the reason I do that is because if you read, I consider myself reasonably educated. But if you just read the ballot one, at least the ones in Michigan lately, I can't understand what a yes vote means and what a no vote means. So what I do is go, uh, check with the uh, groups that have done research on it 
and say, and okay, say, I okay, want to vote yes, yes on this and no on this. <clears throat> but I would be willing to bet you pretty much anything you wanted to bet that 90% plus of the people in 2008 in California that voted on that didn't know what a gestation stall was. I'd be willing to bet a lot of them didn't know what gestation was. Okay, but that doesn't matter because you get to vote. Okay, so you don't have to be a consumer to vote. The other so avenue is, is that retailers, retailers processors, processors, so, so restaurants, restaurants, supermarket chains, and others uh, have been mandating that they want food produced, produced in a certain way, that they want the producers to uh, verify, um, sometimes sign affidavits. Um, and if you accept money uh, for, for a production practice the way you're doing it, like if you sign an affidavit to say you weren't using BST free anymore, that you, sorry, that you weren't using VST anymore, and you continue to use it. If you've taken more than $1,000 in sales for that, that is now a felony. You've, you've signed a contract on that, whether you realize it or not. Um, the, the retailers and processors are worried about the corporate image, and these, in some sense, are fairly costless and easy things for them to do if they want to get a positive uh, uh, press out there. All right, so, right, so as, as, as I kind of mentioned, if you're thinking about these two avenues, whether they're legal uh, with ballot initiatives or whether it's the market, um, I think the title of this presentation was Public Perceptions, um, because in general, that the public is what matters, and, and here's what I mean by that. Everybody's in the public, uh, whether you're vegetarian and vegan and you don't consume any dairy products or not. So depending on what surveys you uh, believe it's somewhere in the three to five percent of the population are vegetarian and vegan, maybe a little bit higher in some locations, a little bit less in others. But you don't have to be a consumer to vote, but consumers, of course, are the ones that are driving the market decisions. And then a third way that has been uh, a response in the last decade or so. Um, and so think about the farm program, the Farmers Assuring Responsible Management is an example of this, has been for producers to, uh, to attempt to get ahead of this and to drive the discussion and the policies and voluntarily adopt, confirm, or verify production practices. Okay, and so this is to help maintain the social license to produce. And it's uh, in some sense, in some cases, for some things, it's for premium or market access. And this whole set of issues is really important to producers um, because of the amount that you have invested in your operation, right? Um, ag agriculture in general, modern agriculture, is very capital intensive. It takes a lot of assets. It takes a lot of land, a lot of facilities, a lot of money invested in cows to produce milk at a commercial level. And you don't want to invest uh, in the wrong production technologies, in the wrong facilities, in the wrong practices. Um, and you certainly don't want to do that if it might mean anything that to do with market access, which kind of traditionally we haven't worried so much about, but has been in the news not for these reasons, but for other reasons, right? In the last year or so, as, as um, markets have gotten tight, um, it's been an increasingly important issue. So as I said, I'm, I'm mostly talking about animal welfare related things here, or, or practices that the public perceives as animal welfare related. Um, that, that, that you may, you may not. not. Um, but, but also, you think about what, what, what the story has been with BST, BST and which was, was just in the news just recently, because um, Alanco announced they were selling BST. BST. Um, but, but if you, you look, look at, at and, and, and I'm not going to get into that, although well, we do have some pretty interesting research from a few years back when the BST phased out of Michigan about what the consumer and producer responses were. But you think about GMO now, right, and the increasing amount of products particularly, for example, yogurts that say GMO-free, that then um, mandate what you can do as far as uh, your feed production to be GMO-free. And you know, um, that has implications for the production practices. It also has environmental implications and all those other things, which the people that want this are not necessarily thinking of. When they're thinking GMO-free, what does that mean for what you're going to end up planting and how much herbicides and pesticides you're going to use? Um, um, which, they're which they're almost, almost certainly, certainly not aware of or not thinking of. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just kind of as a brief aside, food safety is kind of the overriding concern uh, for some people on these topics. 
Um, um, and in and fact, fact, when we do experiments, experiments and surveys, and surveys anymore, anymore with consumers, consumers we, we, have, have, we, don't we don't do food, food safety, safety anymore. anymore. We, we used to throw, throw food safety in and it swamped everything else. Because if you're worried about whether the food you're buying for your kids is safe, I mean, you're not going to be buying that, right? You're going to find alternatives. Um, and so um, that's kind of anything that gets conflated with food safety demands a lot of attention and gets big reactions in the market. Uh, whether, whether, it, whether it should be conflated with food safety or not. But if you start doing studies with consumers, you'll see that um, in some ways because of the labels that have been put on it, farm size is conflated with food safety, well, whether it should be or not. And in general, the answer is it shouldn't be. Um, that certain production technologies like BST, like GMO, um, if there's a, a certain amount of uncertainty in there, that that gets conflated with food safety. Uh, and animal welfare also gets conflated with food safety, um, which makes maybe less sense in the dairy case uh, and more sense if you were thinking beef uh, with like a BSE or something like that. But that's not what's going on here. Um, but that's certainly, if that comes in the picture, um, then you're losing the perception battle, definitely. So, so, why do you, why care, you about care about all this stuff? stuff? Well, the big, the big thing, thing is, is the social license to operate. So, so social, social license here, I mean the acceptance uh, of, uh, of your, your operational practices, practices by the public, public and the stakeholders. stakeholders. And farmers, if you do, if you do surveys, surveys, you'll find that the, the American public admires farmers, farmers, that they like farmers, farmers and that they trust farmers. farmers. And that, 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 that comes up repeatedly. And that's, that's a, good a good thing, thing right? So, so you all have social license to operate, and people, people like farmers, and they trust them, and they should. Um, but if you, um, don't, if you have don't have social license, so the reason you don't want to mess with this is if you don't have social license, that's how you, that's how you end up with regulations. You end up being monitored and or litigated for compliance with these laws. OK? So that's kind of what's at stake. This is why you need to, you know, to care what they think. And the other aspect, kind of that bigger picture of, to think about, is what's called rational ignorance, or what I'm calling rational ignorance for the sake of this discussion, which is that we all only have so much time that we can pay attention to the different issues. And um, if you think about what's involved in your life now with the technology you use, with the, where the food comes from that you eat, where the phone comes from that you use, where the power is generated and how it's generated and everything else, we can't possibly be up in arms and paying attention to every little thing. We can't. So there, well, all of us take certain things that we're just going to have that have been working for us, and we're going to have faith in it, and we're not going to worry about being the world's foremost expert on everything. Um, so, so in, 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 in general, general, actually, the way, the way that's, that's been, been historically for the American public is that they've, they've been, been fine, fine being rationally, rationally ignorant about food production. Food um, um, and and you know, when, when we started, started working, working on some of these issues 10, 15 years ago, there were, there were certainly, certainly lots of people that I talked to in agriculture that said, let's let sleeping dogs lie, which I think is a perfectly fine response in a lot of situations. But in some of these, also it's, you know, um, not, not, uh, not, not going to work because you, you have to understand, to understand what's going on and where they're coming from. from. Whoops. Whoops. Let me see. There we go. All right. All right so, so let me use some, some broad generalizations, generalizations uh, from the uh, agricultural uh, economics, economics literature, literature from, from stuff, stuff that, that I've written with colleagues, but stuff that other people have written. Um, um, and these, these kind of trends, trends you find, you whether you're doing eggs or you're doing milk and yogurt or you're doing beef or pork or bacon. Although, Although bacon's, bacon's kind of an outlier, outlier. Um, which, which is a whole, I have a, I have a colleague, colleague that I work with a lot at Purdue, Purdue and she, and, and um, people, people don't care about animal welfare, but if you, you ask about, about pork chops or ground pork or ham, ham with pork, pork, then people care about the, the, the production, production issues. And if you ask, ask the same, same questions about bacon, bacon, bacon she says bacon is like the crack of meat. People just want to have bacon, and then then that they let that go. But, uh, but, uh, but, you but you know, it's, it's the whole, whole pig, pig, right? The bacon's, the bacon's only part of it, which is also another issue. issue. Um, um, pigs pig kind of come in whole parts. parts. They, don't they don't come. come. But anyway, anyway, if you do these studies on these different products, eggs, chickens, milk, beef, pork, what you find is that 
Two thirds to 75% of consumers, their overwhelming concern is with price. Right? We all have budget constraints. Some people's budget constraints bind earlier than others. But what they mostly care about is price. They want to, of course, this assumes that we have safe food and let's all just stipulate that, you know, it's safe food because we have that. So what they're concerned then about is, is price. So if, if Walmart wants to put milk on sale for 69 cents a gallon, or was that what it was, Kathy? What is it? Oh, was it 85 now? It's gone up? Or wait, who had 69? Wasn't that Aldi's? Oh, I'm sorry, Aldi's. Then they're happy. They'll go buy the milk for 69 cents a gallon at Aldi's in, in uh, where's that at? Cadillac, Michigan. Um, <laughs> so that's their biggest concern. Uh, but a relatively small share, and this depends on how you ask the question and who you're asking and stuff. It, but it's about 10 to 15 percent. So it's about uh, a tenth to a sixth of people care a great deal about any given issue, like a lot. Okay, um, so pick your issue, BST or um, you know some an animal welfare issue. And as I said before, the production process is tied to these food safety, uh, environmental, and quote factory farm aspects um, with a lot of people. So they, they think it's all tied up together. If they don't if they don't trust one part of it, they're unlikely to trust the other parts as well. Uh, second, second summary, summary. Many, many consumers and voters do not consider the potential costs of what, what they, they say they want. want. So, so we, we did, did a lot of, st and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that, that later, but we did, uh, we did a lot of uh, work in California just prior to that 2008 vote on Prop 2. And um, as I'll show you, most people weren't thinking that if they voted to change these the required practices for the poultry and pork producers that that was going to have any effect on their food costs at all. Okay, so, okay, so there's, there's kind, kind of a of disconnect, disconnect there. there. <clears throat> and uh, as, I as I mentioned earlier, the videos and the other uh, 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 press, uh, press negatively, negatively affect, affect the demand, demand whether it's um, um, eggs. eggs. So, so, so um, in 2008, 2008 to that run-up run up in California, there was, there was lots, lots and lots of uh, advertising on both sides of that. Of that. Um, the, the poultry and pork industries were advertising, or you know, were running a campaign against Prop 2. And, and uh, he made say the United States and others were more uh, running a campaign for it. And actually, just that press on the on the cage on the hen cages versus the so-called cage-free or other aviaries had a positive impact on cage-free eggs and a negative impact on conventional eggs. Just in the run-up to the pop, to the to the vote. So just fighting that fight in in terms of commercials and campaigns actually. It significantly, it significantly affected consumption, consumption patterns. patterns. So, 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 so if, you, if, if there, is there is a ballot, ballot coming up, you, you also want to think about, about is it is worth it having this fight? fight? If it's, if it's almost, almost certainly going to pass. And, and by the way, the way, way they, they put that language in the Prop 2 in California, which is almost the same language that's in Michigan's legislation, which is almost the same language that's in Arizona's, Florida's, Oregon's, and the other states that have adopted this, says that you want animals to be able to stand up, lie down, and turn around. And, and um, basically, 70% of people, of people are never going to vote against that. that. They're, They're not, not going in the voting booth and vote against letting, letting animals stand, stand up, lie down, and turn around. It sounds, it sounds, it sounds pretty draconian to be fighting, fighting that, that to most, most people. people. Uh, so, uh, so let me give you some results from some of the uh, different surveys and in, in, um, other auctions and other experiments that we've done. Um, so this, if it's a... Smaller number, number, that means people agree more. So, so most, most people had pretty strong agreement that dairy farmers faced a trade-off at some level between profitability and animal welfare. So that's, so that's not, not such a good thing. thing. Um, um, and, this and this one says the one says average American. American. And the reason, the reason we do, the, the reason we ask both these questions twice is um, um, there's something called social desirability bias, which is also uh, what you'll see called the Bradley effect in the, in the press, right? Which is, um, if somebody, somebody comes up to you on the street and asks you a question, question um, you, you are more likely to answer in a way that you think makes you look good, good. right? So, so the Bradley, Bradley effect has to do with uh, a mayoral election, election back in the 80s in Los, in Los Angeles where there was an African-American gentleman running and um, all the polling suggested he was running ahead and then he lost. 
and what they decided was that the people that were asked in the polls um, were said that they were going to vote for him and when they didn't. And the same thing happens to some extent when you start asking about animal welfare and other issues. People will say that they care more about it in some sense than they do because of this social desirability bias to what they perceive. Um, because they don't realize they're talking to Aggies when we're asking them questions. But uh, so it's what you see here is uh, this is uh, this is what the, us asking them whether low milk prices are more important than the well-being of cattle, and they're saying they disagree with that. And then this is what they say the average American thinks. And so one little way we have to get around social desirability bias is to ask them what they would do, and then ask them what the average American would do. And nine times out of ten, what they say the quote average American would do is actually closer to what they would do. Um, so. So, and th this one is not statistically different. Uh, they, they think that they do and the average American believes that there's a trade-off. And this one here says that they actually agree more that uh, low milk prices are more important than the well-being. So this one is them saying, I don't really agree that low milk prices are more important. And this is them saying the average American actually thinks low milk prices are more important. That's probably more in line with what they think. Uh, so this is from a couple years ago. Uh, we, did we did a big nationwide, nationwide um, survey about whether the people uh, had, had seen media stories, stories about animal welfare, welfare related, related to the dairy, dairy industry. industry. And 30% uh, of the people, of the people and this, this, this is a big, big survey, survey, it's like 3,000 like people nationwide, it has statistical significance. Um, so 30% of Americans, of Americans said that they could recall seeing a uh, story related, related to animal welfare, welfare in the dairy industry, and 70% said they hadn't. Um, and the and ones that had seen it basically, basically usually saw it either on television or the internet, internet which, which we'd expect. expect. Um, um, same, same survey, survey. <clears throat> who, who has, has the most, most accurate, accurate uh, welfare information related to dairy cattle? cattle. Um, um, so, so the, the number, number one, one source, source for accurate, accurate information related to dairy cattle, the public said, was the U.S. US Department of Agriculture. Of Agriculture. And number two, two was, was the Humane Society of the United States. States. Um, um, you know, you the know, funny thing, thing about, about government, government is that, that right, we've all seen the information about, about you know, know, Congress has an 18% approval rating, and we don't trust government to do this, and we don't trust government to do that. But when we do surveys and we ask, who do you want to verify food safety? Who do you want to verify animal welfare? Who do you want to do all these things? It's always government. Always. That always comes out first. Um, because, well, I mean, in, in a sense, this is the role of government, right? They're supposed to be able to do these things that if you don't necessarily trust an industry to do it, or if it's a public good, and we all care about it and it benefits everybody, that's exactly what government should be doing. So the good news is they trust the Department of Agriculture. Um, they don't, they don't trust, trust, they don't trust, they don't trust PETA. PETA. Yeah. That, was that was tied, tied with the International Dairy Foods, Foods Association. Association. <laughs> um, um, so, so it was, it was Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Humane Society of the United States, States, States AVMA. AVMA. So that's, that's good news, good news. In, in a sense, sense there, okay. okay. And, and, um, and, and, and a, third a third of people, people we've, we've said, said they could also say, I don't know, which is a perfectly fine answer. I haven't thought about this, I don't know. Right? right? So, so uh, uh, roughly on a, a, a third, third of these, of these all these people, people just, just, I don't know. And, and, and that's, that's probably, probably about accurate. accurate. Um, same, same survey. survey. Higher that number means, means, so this, this is, is how high, high and we, we, we did, did a, a big, big survey, survey of producers, producers too, too, which some so of you in the room may have gotten, gotten even. We did over a thousand dairy producers across the country. Because uh, we, uh, we, we lined up these, these uh, surveys so we could ask the same kind of sets of questions and compare producer perceptions to consumer perceptions. So this was which of these people or groups has the most ability kind of to influence dairy cattle welfare? So if it's a higher number, that means they had, that they, these are averages, okay, scores, but um, they, that means they thought they had a higher ability to influence uh, welfare. And so this is a public, so this is the general public in the first two columns, and this is the um, dairy producers in the second one. Um, and so there's a couple of interesting things here. Uh, first of all, um, the general public thought the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which kind of lines up with that last slide, right? That the Department of Agriculture had the most ability to influence 
uh, uh, welfare. Uh, welfare. And, and the second, second most was, was dairy farmers, farmers which, which strange, strange to me that they're second. second. And they were they first were for the producers, producers which, which makes the most sense because these are the people, the people that are dealing with the cattle, cattle every day. day. But, 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 um, but then, then it, it kind of gets out of alignment. So for the public, it's the Department of Agriculture, then dairy farmers, and then national milk producers, and American Farm Bureau, and IDFA, which my hypothesis would be none of them had ever heard of National Milk Producers or IDFA before, but that's, you know, they could also say I don't know. Um, then for the producers, they thought they had the most ability to influence cattle welfare, and the second most was their local veterinarian, which is going to be on the herd periodically, right? And then um, the co-ops, which are setting the pricing and marketing policies, and then, you know, consumers and Department of Agriculture was... But, but if you look at this, a pattern kind of emerges, which is the general public trusts groups to have influence over it, and dairy farmers trust individuals, um, which in a sense lines up with their relationship to the industry, right? Dairy farmers are dealing with cattle every day. They understand that the individual decisions on how you deal with the cow have the biggest influence on that cow's welfare. The public doesn't have the context or the understanding, really, of milk, of milk production today, today. And, and they, they have, have the most trust, trust in the groups that, that they may or may not realize in some case are marketing or lobbying groups to have influence. influence. So, so um, um, I, thought I thought that was interesting. interesting. Um, <clears throat> then, we then we took, took and we picked, picked out some, some different, different practices, practices from, from the farm program, program the Farmers Assuring Responsible Management, management from the Humane Farm Animal care, I forget the name of that. There's a few different programs. And we looked at the different programs and we said, what are the practices that they, that they expect and, by, and that you all would expect also to be the case on dairy farms, at least for most of these? And, we, and so here's um, uh, nine different practices. Um, I think we could all, I mean, look, access to fresh, and then we said, which one is the most effective and, and we asked, asked it separately because we wanted to see if they would say whether effective would be different than practical, and the answer is they really didn't. Um, but again, this is public, this is the producers. Higher score means they think that's more effective in, in, in increasing uh, dairy cattle welfare. Lower score means less effective. One thing about whenever you ask things on a Likert scale, one of the things is that there's no trade-offs required. Um, and frankly, all these you could probably have. But, but in the real, real world, there's lots of times when Likert's, and we actually have a whole set of choice experiments where we make them trade things off and, and pay, and I'm not going to present a lot of that here, but I can show you where it is if you want to see it. But with a Likert scale, you can just say, I want everything, right? It's Because you can just score them all high. So you have to keep that in mind. But still, um, you know, so the, you know, access to fresh feed and fresh and clean feed and water, I mean, you ain't gonna get much milk out of the cows unless they have that, right? So, um, you know, and that's what people would expect as the most important. And we can all agree that's just fundamental to life. You've got to have that. Um, and the second one is assuring clean, dry, sanitary conditions for cattle. And um, of course, also important. And my hypothesis would be that one of the reasons that that scored so high is if you watch those undercover videos that come out, it seems like inevitable that the cows are filthy in those videos. It just, it just, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, sure that when they were they picking were which videos, videos to use, you also want to use the ones that you think will have the biggest impact. But man, those cows are always dirty. dirty. And, and, and you know, there's, there's times of year when it's muddy, muddy right? right? So that, you know, this, this stuff, stuff happens, but they're, they're always, always dirty, dirty in those videos. videos. Um, <clears throat> and then the and third, third biggest, biggest one here was promptly treat or euthanize injured or sick cows, which also, I would argue, is related to those videos. Because, because inevitably, inevitably in those videos, videos it seems like there's like downer cows that are being drugged or, you know, there's a downer cow that somebody's trying to get up, um, um, usually not being very nice about it, uh, and, you know, and, you know things, things like that. So I think that, that those videos, videos had a big, had a big impact, impact on, on people's, people's perceptions, perceptions here. here. Um, um, then we asked, asked the producers, if you had to supply this, what would be the most expensive? And you could kind of basically... Uh, so if uh, so you look, you look back, back at this, this there's, there's, there's two, two here that kind of not necessarily everybody would have access to outdoor exercise areas for at least four hours a day, weather permitting, okay, which if you have a freestall bar, that, that, by the way, that means access, right? So that probably means you can open the gate, and if they, I mean, it depends on the program you're in. 
but for some of the programs, what that means is you can open the gate, and if they don't want to go out, they don't want to go out, which is going to be the case sometimes. Right? So, and then the other one is third-party verification of cow welfare, which um, some programs require, and those tend to be ones that cost some money. Because you've got to have somebody that's out there inspecting periodically. So, and those are the two that, that stood out from producers as uh, would be the most expensive if they had to adopt. So 42.6% said that would be expensive for them to adopt outdoor access. So these are probably operations that have free stall barns and, um, you know, where land is expensive and they're probably not providing a lot of outdoor access. And then third-party verification. But those are ones that consumers wanted that the industry would then, you know, have to... Um, um, <clears throat> pay, pay, pay to implement. implement. So, so that, that kind of sets, sets the, 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 the uh, table, table for, for where we're at as, as, far, as far as some of these perceptions, perceptions um, and, where and where the markets, the markets are at a little bit. bit. So, but let's, let's talk, talk about, about some potential, potential solutions. solutions. And I have it in quotes because whether you think it's a, a, a problem or not would probably determine whether you think we need a solution, right? I mean, there's, there's certainly things that we all see every day that we think, well, that's a solution in search of a problem. Um, like, you know, on cable news, if you watch, you know that, right? So, um, so when I say that, but these are maybe potential ways forward or things that we might consider or that might happen. Um, so legislation, and there might be legislation, by the way, that the industry wants. Because sometimes legislation you, makes things uniform. If you're in a state where they've, where they've banned some practices in other states it's not banned, you might prefer that we had national legislation that would make things uh, more even plain. Okay? Um, labels are another one. Edu and I'm going to talk about all of these, go into a little more detail on these. Okay? Uh, education programs uh, for the public or for the market. And voluntary certification programs. So let's talk about this. So currently, not really in dairy because we haven't had a lot of issues. I mean, there's been some decisions like the tail docking legislation that, that was passed and signed into law in California in 2010 that now has been adopted as part of the farm program, right, the, with the no tail docking. So it's kind of now become um, nationwide. Um, but, you know, so this applies more in, like, the eggs and the pork, but it could apply in the future, um, and there's certain issues it might apply. Uh, for dairy, for dairy so, so something, something to think about as far as, as there's, there's a patchwork, patchwork of legislation, legislation ballot initiatives, and, and livestock standards, standards boards. boards. So, so there's, there's six states, states that have either ballot or legislation that's been passed in those areas, and there's three or four more states that have livestock standards boards that are going to set this, and, and so you end up with this kind of patchwork of different, um, not so much in dairy, but definitely in, in eggs and, and pork standards. and so. You know, you know, that, that motivates, motivates and, and the United Egg Producers a couple years ago, by the way, was, was on board with, with the national, national legislation. legislation. They wanted to make it uniform across the country. And, um, and the, the biggest, biggest people that were fighting that were actually the pork producers. producers. Even though it was, the legislation was just about eggs, um, there was, the pork producers were concerned that the next thing would be the pork. Because that, that slippery slope argument always works on farmers, by the way. I don't buy that on some things. We've done some work, and there's, there's a lot of things that, that farmers worry about on slippery slope that aren't even on the public's radar anywhere. Although, I mean, I guess I can see it. But you can slippery slope that both directions. So, um, As I said, most evidence that we've got suggests that people don't consider what the cost implications are when they vote for these things. Um, and let me, let me tell you a little more about that 2008. So this, we did this survey. Um, um, it was a big nationwide, nationwide survey, but we, we, we used, used the, the, the California, California wording. wording. Uh, and, and we did this in October of 2008, 2008 right? So it was like three, three weeks before, before people went to the uh, ballot, ballot box. box. We did it intentionally because we wanted to see whether we were going to be able to predict the results and some things like that. And the answer is that we were, actually didn't do too bad. Um, but basically it said, would you vote to require farmers to confine calves raised for veal, egg-laying hens, and pregnant pigs only in ways that allow these animals to lie down, stand up, fully extend their limbs, and turn around freely, which has mirrored the Prop 8 legislation intentionally, okay? We were trying to be like that. So, and then uh, we, and I'm not going to, then we asked follow-up questions where we said, um, so basically, if you said that you would vote for this, then you, if you said yes, you got a follow-up question that said, would you vote for it if the price was going to go up X percent because of it? 
or there was a, we did a, a price and a tax version. Um, where the other one was where we said, would you vote for it if your taxes were gonna go up this much to pay for implementing this? So, um, what you basically saw was, um, and this is the different versions, and they all tell the same story, was basically 30% uh, of people said that they would not vote for that. So they wouldn't vote for this mandated production change, okay? So 70% said they would. And if you, if you look at the Prop 8 voting, that's almost exactly what it was. Was up, it was about 65% uh, voted yes, and it passed, okay? Um, and so we, our numbers suggested 70, but if you take out hypothetical and social desirability bias, then we're pretty close. Um, so, but basically two thirds said they would vote yes. But if you then, so they could either vote no, in which case they didn't get a follow-up question because they didn't vote to have this, or they could vote yes and then no because we said, hey, it's gonna cost you this random amount of money, and which means, oh, well, I'm not gonna vote for it if it's gonna cost me anything. Okay? okay? Or, or you, you could, could say, say yes, yes and then say yes again, again with yes, I'll, I'll pay for that. So, so what, you what you basically see is, is almost exactly as a third, a third, a third. third. So, so one third of people said, no, I'm not going to vote for that, and that's about what happened in real life. And, and, and then, then one third, third said, said, I'll vote for that, and then we said, it's going to cost you five cents more a dozen eggs or whatever it was. We had random amounts that we put in there, and then they changed their vote. And then one third that said, I'll pay for it. Okay, so. Ba roughly, roughly, this is 50-50 of the people that voted yes, yes to begin with, right? right? So half, half the people, people that voted yes, yes would not have voted yes, yes had they known it was going to cost them money. And, and if you, you look, look at the, and, and so, so this, this is, is not dairy directly, directly right? right? But, but if you, if you look, look at it, the, 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 the alternative the cage systems are going to increase the operating costs by on the order of 20% and the overall cost of eggs. And you know, eggs don't cost that much, but you use them in lots of different things. And if we start increasing the cost of food everywhere by 10% uh, or more uh, to rely on the, to get these production practices, that starts at some point, it's real money. So, um, different, different survey, survey, also a big nationwide survey. <clears throat> we asked people, would you vote for the following propositions? Would you vote to limit antibiotic use for cattle to only disease treatment? Um, would you vote to ban castration without the use of pain control? Would you vote to ban the use of BST? And we always, whenever we do surveys, we always say RBST slash RBGH. Because if you care about that issue and you don't like it, you call it BGH. And if you care about that issue and you don't mind it, you call it BST. And we don't have a dog in that fight. So we just want people to answer the question, okay? So, uh, and then finally, would you vote to ban the use of non-organic feed in the, in the dairy industry? So, um, you don't, you, you can't read that, which is fine. I'm gonna tell you what it says in a minute. I just, uh, I'm an economist, I have to put up a bunch of numbers there. I'm required professionally to put up some slides that you can't read, but I'm not putting up any math, so I have to put up a whole bunch of numbers. Um, but basically, so we're look, so basically they could say yes, no, or I don't know. To, any, to these questions here. Uh, yes, yes, I would I vote, vote for that. that. No, no, I would not I vote, vote for that, or I don't know. Um, um, so, so, and you might think of the people that don't know as the people that might not just, might not, just, might not vote on that if they went in the voting booth. Right, right? So, so, and then, and then, then we, have we have information about them, like how old they are, how much education they have, whether they're male or female, how big their household is, what their household income is, how much they spend each week on food, whether they're from the West, Midwest, Northeast regions. South region would be omitted whenever you have dummy variables, you've got to admit one. What are they indicated that they don't consume any dairy? No milk, we don't consume dairy products. Whether they had indicated that they had recently seen any media about animal welfare, and whether they um, have concerns about animal welfare and production agriculture. So those are, they said, yes, we have concerns, or no, we don't. Um, so, and so 68% said they would vote to restrict antibiotics to just disease treatment. Um, um, and 11% said they wouldn't, and 20% said they don't know. And a similar story uh, as far as restricting castration without pain control, 68% said they would. Which, you know, there are places in the world, like in Europe, where uh, pain control is required with castration. So it's not something that's completely out of the realm of possibility. And 13% said no, and 19% said they don't know. Um, 
50% said they would ban BST, and 9% said they wouldn't, and 41% said they don't know, and the answer is that the market has kind of worked that out anyway, right? Um, at least it seems to be headed that direction. And uh, whether they would pay a premium for BST-free milk, so 50% of them wanted to ban it, but only a third want to pay a premium to have BST-free milk. And then was, that was roughly a third, a third, a third. But if you look, if you look at this, at this and you can't see this, this but, but some of these are in bold and they're starred because they have significant effects and some of them and don't, don't have significant, significant effects. But what you see, um, um, and not, not just in this survey, survey but in other surveys we've done, we've done that have been similar, similar is, is that, that if you're, you're talking, talking about voting, voting for a ban on, on some, some production practice, practices, whether it's BST or castration or we've did dehorning, we did tail docking, we've done laying hen cages, things like that. Older people are more likely to vote yes. I don't have a good explanation for why that is, but older people have, are, are significantly more likely to vote yes than younger people. And women, and this is controlling for all those other things. So that's older controlling for gender and income and all that stuff, okay? Um, women are more likely to vote yes. They have more empathy, apparently. Uh, higher people with higher incomes are more likely to vote yes. In some, in some sense, sense, these are rich people issues, right? right? If, if you're yeah, worried about where your next meal is going to come from, you know, you're, you're not, not so concerned, so concerned about, about these other issues, issues as long as it's safe, safe food. food. Um, um, and, 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 and if, if you, you have, have more income, income, income and income, and income you're, you're, you're more, more certain, certain, so you're, so you're more, more, less likely to say you don't know, more likely to say yes. If you spend more on food, you're more likely to say yes. But that's controlling for income. Okay. If you've, if you've said, said that you've, you've seen, seen animal welfare, welfare media, which, which means probably, probably some selection, selection bias in there too, because some, sometimes, sometimes you've got to go looking if you want to see animal welfare media, media. Then, you're then you're more likely, likely to say yes. yes. If you say you have animal welfare, welfare concerns, concerns about, about U.S. Agriculture, agriculture, you're more likely to say yes, which yes. seems like a duh. Okay, okay so, so, so those so are kind of, so there's demographic issues going on here. And, you know, certainly there are different groups that target things this way, and, and ag groups can target things that way too. Um, as an economist, one solution I like is labels. Okay, let's not ban things. I, I, as an economist, we think people should have choices. So let's put, so actually, if you go buy eggs um, at any reasonable sized supermarket, you have about 18 different options. You, they can be brown, they can be white, they can be all different sizes, they can be organic, they can be not organic, they can be high omega-3 or not, um, and now there's cage-free in there, which I would argue most people don't know what that means, and they're thinking free range, but that's beside the point. Okay? So we can label these things. Um, but there's a whole literature on labels uh, in, in Ag Econ that's pretty interesting. Um, and so there's some pros and cons to labels. So the so pros, pros are it provides information and can enhance trusts, trust, okay? okay? Where you're being transparent, you're being clear about how this was produced. It was BST-free, or it was grass-fed, or it was, you know, certified Angus beef, or whatever. Most people don't know what that means either, but again, they don't have to know what it means if that's what they want and they're willing to pay for it. I'd say give it to them. Um, it can, so it can assist in segmenting the market, and in a lot of times that can be really good for producers if you can segment the market and extract some premiums out. Um, then we can argue about who's actually getting the premiums. Is, it ha is the premium uh, occurring at the retail level and being kept by the retailer, or is it getting back to the process level, uh, processor level, and is it getting all the way back to the farm? And there's asymmetric responses there that are an issue if you're a farmer. Um, you want to know whether you're going to get yours or not. Um, but there's also cons on these labels. And a uh, first, first one is one potential, potential information, information overload. overload. Um, um, so that additional, that additional information, information is, can be distracting and can complicate, complicate decisions. decisions. And we can we maybe can all think of things, things where, where we just decided, decided to, to um, um, stop, stop worrying, worrying about, about some of the details and something we were buying because it was just getting too complicated. complicated. Okay? okay. Uh, uh, there's uh, a whole there's literature that suggests that when you first put a label on a product, like if you didn't have a BST-free label on the milk before and you put one on, it's going to have a big effect for a couple months. And then the effect is going to, as soon as people get used to seeing that label on there, they don't notice it anymore. So that's an issue, and that's a separate issue, actually. But another one is if you have everything labeled, 
it can just be too much. I just want milk, stop bothering her. I just want eggs, stop, just give me some eggs. Okay? The, the, it can also lead to confusion and misperception because some people can draw conclusions from label on one thing that's not on the other thing, uh, perhaps incorrectly. When you over-label things, sometimes people get elevated food safety and risk perceptions. They perceive there's some risk involved there when it's really not different than they bought last time. It just has a label on it when the last time it didn't. Uh, it can decrease demand for safe products. If you say this contains something, the literature suggests that that has a negative connotation, whereas if you say it's free of something, that almost always is better. So, contains GMOs is different than GMO free or BST free versus produced without BST. These have, you know, an asymmetric response depending on how it's done. There's also labeling costs. And if you've got to verify it down the food chain, that, that's, that's a big, a big set, set of costs, cost too. too. And frankly, um, um, one that, that the dairy industry, industry is not necessarily set up for in this country, country at the current time. time. It can it also potentially reduce ag productivity, productivity if they start, start if it leads to production practices, practices being given up that were productive and profitable. So, for example, the BST uh, it, it has been basically gone in Michigan since 2009. Um, we did a whole bunch of work with producers and consumers in 2008 looking at it because we knew it was coming because we had six months of it kind of coming phase out. Um, and what was interesting about that was um, actually the Michigan co-ops got 75 cents a hundredweight for a period of time and then it phased down to 50 and then it phased out eventually, which is, by the way, is what tends to happen with premiums. Um, what was interesting, what's interesting was, was that, that that premium that the farmers, that the farmers were being paid was almost exactly equal to what consumers said they were willing to pay. So, so I don't, I don't know, know how the retailers, retailers were working it out, but it, but it lined, lined up really closely. closely. But the other, the other thing that was interesting was that, that there was an option value to using BST by the farmers. farmers. So, so even farmers, farmers that, that weren't using BST weren't, weren't happy about losing the potential to use it in the future. future. Right? And right? And you can think about this with these other production technologies too. You don't necessarily have to be using it today to have lost something because you're going to lose the option value. So you so weren't you tail docking, okay? okay? So they banned tail docking. You don't have to change anything. But there might have been a, a situation in the future where you wanted to, and now you don't have that option. And you can think about that with, you know, one technology after another. And, and so it is potential lost ag productivity, which everything else equal in the long run means higher food costs too, which we already know that people aren't thinking about. <clears throat> Educational programs is a big one. Um, that, um, that a lot, a lot of, of agriculture talks, talks about. about. And I think there's, there's lots of good things about them. About okay, so, so as, as I, I said, said, few people have context for this production agriculture. agriculture. It's only 2%. 2 and there's, and there's some evidence that education, that education can be effective. Can be effective. Um, um, but there's, there's some cons, cons too. too. Right? This, this, this isn't a free, free lunch, lunch, I would argue. Um, first of all, people have to want to be educated. It's a little hard to grab people and educate them. You know, even, even the, the students, students that I have in my farm, farm business management class and, and, and operations, operations management class at Michigan State, State who are paying a whole lot of money to be sitting out there in the audience, audience some, some of them don't want to be educated as far as I can tell. Okay, okay so, so you've, you've got, got to want, want it because there's, 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 there's some work involved, involved there too. too. Um, um, you still lack the context. If you take somebody that hasn't been on a farm and you take them out and, you know, you're dehorning or you're castrating, that's, That's not, not something, something that they are going to necessarily understand. understand. They're just, just not, not, right? right? Um, and, and there's, there's some, some evidence in some, in some of these, of these programs, programs that the education, the education actually can result in a more, more negative, negative view when the people, people finish it than them before, before they started. started. Um, and, I, and I'm not, this isn't, a, I know specifically of a study on this, and it was actually related to pork, uh, not dairy, but I, I would argue that the same thing is almost certainly true on certain practices for dairy, which they did this big education program with the general public, and they asked them about what they thought about pork production beforehand and afterhand, and afterwards, and actually there was a negative shift on average. They thought less about the pork industry when they finished than they had before they started. Um, so it can have negative in some situations. Uh, some more uh, thoughts on, on education. So, so what do you mean, mean as an industry, industry or as a, as a farmer when you say you're going to educate? Um, 
Because you're, you're, you're advocating, advocating too, right? right? And, and, and that's, that's okay. okay. We should, we should advocate, advocate for ourselves. For ourselves. But, but particularly, particularly here, I'm thinking, thinking about, about social media. media. Yeah. Okay. And I've, by the way, pretty much given up on social media. Here's what I use social media for, to see what my friends and family's kids are doing. That's it. Okay. Um, so maybe that's just me, but I don't see a whole lot of productive discussions happening there. Maybe they are, and I'm not seeing them, in which case send them to me so I can see them, because then I have more faith in humanity again. But, but I don't see much of it, okay? Um, so, so, you know, you know when, when everybody's, everybody's advocating, advocating then, then you really, really can't have, have a conversation. conversation. Okay? And, and if people, people don't think they're being heard, they're just going to stop talking. talking. And, 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 you know, you know this, this is probably not politically correct, correct but, it but it is true. true. If you, you have, have a crazy, crazy activist, activist on each side, side they, don't they don't cancel each other out and you get one sane person. Okay? Okay? So, just because somebody is crazy on one side, you go and equally far to the other side, is probably not going to get positive, positive results. results. So, so voluntary, voluntary industry programs, programs that's, that's another avenue, avenue and actually the dairy industry is down that avenue to some extent, extent right? right? Um, um, a, little a little bit behind, behind moving down that avenue of like the egg, egg yeah, the poultry producers, producers and the pork, but the reason is that the poultry and, and pork producers um, had more uh, pressing issues than dairy, dairy has. has. But, the but the Farmers, farmers Assuring, assuring Responsible, Responsible Management Program, program is a good example of a voluntary, voluntary program that can that help uh, improve, improve public, public image. image. Um, um, what, what we, we find, find when we ask people, people about whether they have faith in programs, programs like this is a lot, lot of it depends on who's behind it. So, so for example, people are, are, are much more likely to approve it if it's like a USDA process verified program, PVP. Uh, which, uh, which farm is not currently, some other some programs, programs are. are. Um, um, you can do PVPs for specific practices, practices or more broadly, but the, the public, public in general, general has more faith, faith, even though they say they don't like government, government they, have they have more faith, faith that there's government, government behind it. Because um, um, consumers, consumers in general do not trust industries, industries, even though they like you guys as farmers, they don't they trust industries to police themselves because they figure you have a moral hazard issue. And most people think they trust programs that have Real, real consequences, consequences when there's a violation. violation. They, actually they actually have some teeth. teeth. And, and the literature, the literature would suggest that, that if you have a program with teeth, teeth you're more likely to get people actually complying, complying and you're less likely to need inspections, inspections and things like that. Like that. Um, um, the literature, literature would suggest when you're looking, looking at like industry programs, programs not necessarily in agriculture, in agriculture but, but, but this is a pretty robust conclusion, which is if you have a program that has Real, Real consequences, consequences if there's a violation, violation that you, you actually need, need very little policing, policing that people, people will police themselves. themselves. Um, 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 and premiums, uh, you, uh, know, you know, BST, BST premiums, premiums were a thing. thing. They're, They're not, not so much, much anymore. anymore. Um, um, what, what tends, tends to happen, happen is that premiums premium give way to discounts. discounts. So, so you, for, a for a while, there's a premium, premium for a set, set of practices, practices or for doing away with a set of practices. practices. And, and at some, some point, the market, market flips. flips. And, and instead of paying a premium to the people that are doing that, there's a discount for the people that aren't doing that. Which is kind of where we are with some of those things right now, right? At first, there was a premium, did it for a couple of years. Once the bulk of the market has moved that way, now instead of paying a premium for the people that do it one way, you pay a discount to the people that don't. And, and frankly, frankly the, 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 the way the dairy, dairy markets market are structured right now is not so good at, at, at collecting, collecting premiums and getting, and getting them back to farm level. level. Um, um, it's, it's different, different when, when you have a more, more, much more vertically integrated, integrated uh, um, industry, industry like, like, like eggs, eggs or, or pork, pork, where there's a lot fewer players. It's much easier to extract and get the premium back to the farm level. Okay, and in all of this, if we're thinking about uh, food retailer, restaurants, uh, grocery stores, things like that, uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, the restaurants or supermarkets are thinking about their own problem. Okay, so you know the food producers are a really important input here, but ultimately they're optimizing their own program. They're not optimizing farm income. They want you to stay in business because they want you to keep supplying them with safe, affordable food. But that's not the problem they're optimizing, right? Sometimes you're on the same side of the issue, sometimes you're not going to be. Uh, but corporations on their balance sheets will have a line, okay? They will literally have a line on the assets that has to do with their corporate social responsibility view and what their reputation is worth. And they pay attention to that. 
and it matters. And if they think this is going to take a big, uh, you know, um, McDonald's, for example, cared a lot more about some of these animal welfare issues like laying hen cages and gestation-free pork when they were taking a hit on their balance sheet. And so this was a way to get back into this into this game. And in other, in this, as they should, they're optimizing their own problem. Okay? And they have some bargaining and market power, so they have some influence to do things and drive this conversation. Uh, so let me just finish up here. Implications for agriculture. Uh, keep in mind, when you as producers or industries are talking to the consumers and the public that you're not necessarily speaking the same language because you didn't start at the same point. Okay, context matters a lot. But you do need to keep the social license to operate. So, you know, you need to, you gotta listen to your customers, right? Most businesses aren't successful by telling the customers what they want. Most customers don't like to be told what they want. Um, so it's more like, uh, you know, if you ever have to lead a horse or a pig, right? If you push them, they push back. You gotta lead them a little differently. Um, so they go in, they push into pressure. So you gotta listen, you gotta hear, um, you gotta react in a strategic manner, okay? Um, you're optimizing profitability. Um, you don't, you know, you don't have to argue necessarily to do that. And my position is if people are willing to pay for it, you should sell it to them, as long as you can make a profit doing so. So, I think a big implication is to get ahead of the, uh, the interest groups that, that have been advocating on the other side, and perhaps what might be viewed as the other side of animal welfare issues. And I think the farm program is a good step in that direction and the industry is being more proactive. That, that, that way you set the tone, you drive the conversation, you define the practices. The legislation I've mentioned a couple times from Michigan from 2009 on the laying hen cages and the gestation stalls, okay? The pork and poultry industries in Michigan actually wanted that legislation. And the reason they wanted that was because if they didn't, they knew there was gonna be a ballot initiative. And the ballot initiative was going to define the constraints more restrictive than what the legislation did. So that was getting ahead getting it done and getting it done the way they wanted it with their phase in, because if they're gonna, you know, if any of these things change your facility requirements, facilities are a 20 year investment, right? If you just put some new facilities in that don't work, that is a big, big cost. So those, you know, getting ahead is important. Make education available, but I'm, and I think breakfast on the farm and all that stuff, I think it's great, and I think it does lots of good things. But, but the percentage of the population that ultimately end up doing that ends up being relatively small. Doesn't mean it's not worthwhile or good. Just means it ultimately ends up being a relatively small percentage. And I think it's important that industries police themselves on these issues because um, it costs everybody, as I've said a couple times. So that's enough talking from me. If there's anything anybody wants to ask or discuss, I'd be happy to, to chat. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so the question was, what do well, actually, what, are the, what does the industry and the educators think about the alternative milk sources and stuff? And well, and, and I. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, and, and right, and there's a whole argument right now about who gets to use the name milk, right? And so national milk producers would, right, would say, you know, almond milk and soy milk and those other things. Um, yeah, I, I think actually that the proliferation of those alternatives is part of the reason why we've seen that long-range trend uh, down in consumption. A per capita fluid consumption. Um, I personally think that another reason that we've seen the long range trend down, and I'm getting off of your subject, down in per capita fluid consumption is because the school milks all moved to skim milk. Um, and I think a lot of people's milk consumption habits are formed because they're not drinking as much at home and they're formed at school and then if you grow up thinking skim milk is what milk, okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm using a lot of anecdotal evidence here. I, I, my, my kids at home drink a gallon of milk a day 
but we only, well, not each, but I've got, but, but we drink, I have a 17 year old son, so he can do most of that himself. But, but we drink whole milk. My wife is a PhD in nutrition and, and um, you know, don't get her started on fat being good for you, because fat makes you feel full, which so you don't overeat other things and stuff like that. But we have always drank whole milk, and my kids will not drink milk at school. They will not, they won't, they won't, they won't, they won't drink water. Um, because they don't, and so, that, so, so I, think I think that we've got, got all of these things that have kind of, and, and the and news on butterfat, butter right, is really good. Like, like we're, we're short, short on butterfat, butter not, not just in this country, country but globally right, right now. now. And, 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 and so, so everybody has kind of got the story that butterfat butter is a good thing, thing and, and that, that we can eat fat and, you know, and, and it can be a part of a healthy diet. Um, and, and what, what, the school milk is now 1%? They approve 1%, right? Okay. okay, I think, I they, think should they should have, have whole milk, milk but that's, that's, that's I'm getting, getting way, way off the topic, topic. sorry. Yes. 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 Well, well, right, so, so, so BST, BST uh, was uh, commercially uh, approved in 93, 93 and I think, I think you could start, start using it in early 94, if I remember correctly. So uh, 23, 24 years ago. Um, you know, I think part of BST was the timing and that it was the one that, um, it was a new technology in dairy at a time when there was an increasing amount of, of uh, resistance to GMOs and genetic things because there were some other technologies that, like there was, uh, in California, there was something called the Flavor Saver Tomato. Okay, and you know how, you know how they harvest tomatoes when they're green? So they don't smash them all with the automatic harvester and then they, which is why tomatoes don't sometimes taste as good because they were harvested not ripe. Well, the flavor saver tomato, and I was, and this happened in California when I was going to grad school there, so I saw it. Um, they injected this gene in this tomato, and you could then harvest them. You could let them ripen on the plant and then harvest them, and they didn't smash. Um, and they tasted significantly better because they'd actually ripened in the field. But because there was a gene spliced in there, and I want to say it was from a fish, um, that, um, was that was spliced, spliced into that, that tomato. tomato. It, it made, made a big, big splash, splash on the market, market and then the market, market completely rejected it. Um, um, and, and BST came out right around that same time. time. And, 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 and the controversy, controversy in some people's, people's eyes never, never went away. Went away. Even, Even though, though we had, had you, know, you know, at this point, point two decades plus of using it. And furthermore, BST was controversial with a certain set of farmers that didn't want to see the milk production increase. And it, and it is, is true, true, by the way, that 1% of milk production, production either way, we, are, we sit right on that knife's edge, edge between supply and demand, and it doesn't take much to move price because of how inelastic supply and demand are. Um, but I just think there was a, a confluence of factors that, um, that made it controversial. And, and once something becomes controversial or there's some uncertainty associated within some people's minds, they seem to never get past that. You know what I mean? So. Um, I think I there think was all that, that and then, then this, this kind of disadoption that happened was driven totally by retailers. retailers. Okay, okay, so, so the disadoption actually, actually in Michigan, Michigan happened because Kroger, Kroger said we're not going to use it anymore. anymore. And Kroger, Kroger said, said we're not going to, we don't want it anymore because, because Publix, Publix did it in Florida. In Florida. Okay? okay, so, so Publix, Publix does it in Florida and the Southeast region. Kroger says, we're getting, or they perceived they were getting killed on it in that area. And they, and they said, said we, we want, want all of our milk, milk to be, quote, quote BST free. free. And, and um, um, you can't, can't segment the market. You, we, you, know, you know, first, first of all, you don't treat the entire herd, herd right? right? So, so if you're, if you're going, going to use it, it's going to be on the portion of the cows, cows that are eligible, eligible that are making, making money for you on that. that. And you're, you're not, not going to milk, milk them into a separate tank and the truck isn't going to pick up, you know, separately. And so we end up, even though we only needed 25% of the milk production in Michigan to be BST free, doing away with it because we couldn't segregate the other 25%. And so, so it was just this, this kind of confluence, confluence of factors that, that led to that. Sorry, Sorry yeah. yeah.
Well, that, that, that's actually, that's a really, so the question was, what about, I think the public will perceive uh, using uh, maybe more genetics to get at polled versus uh, dehorning, and, and, and certainly there's a trade-off there. Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, most of the public doesn't understand how much breeding has been going on in cattle and plants for decades, right? And so the first thing I think is to, oh, let's all get on the same, or let's try to get on the same page about what's a GMO and stuff, because I think most people are, would not, would not have, have a consistent, consistent definition, definition with, uh, with, uh, with you. Yeah, no, I, I think, think, I think, I think the, 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 that there's, there's definitely, definitely a potential conflict between what, what attributes, attributes people say they want and, and how, how we can, can respond, respond by, by using technologies like gene technologies to give them those attributes but whether they will actually be accepting of them.